Hi folks, welcome back. Tonight's going to be a short little video, and I'm going to be talking about bent spindles on lathes. I had a subscriber write me a very nice letter saying that he is rebuilding a South Bend 9 lathe, and he's almost got it finished, but he's worried about the spindle being bent. So he asked me if I would show him how I would check it, and what we're going to do. Just so happens that in the shop tonight, every night for the last five years, we have a lathe-looking object that in reality is about an eight to $9,000 mistake. Minimal. This lathe was purchased from an auction by a person that shall remain nameless. Well, anyway, Andy bought it sight unseen at an auction. He spent $6,000 for the machine at the auction. And then had to rent a truck and a, a trailer, drive all the way to Houston, get it. And he asked that he bring it over here to my shop because we were having a Richard King scraping class. And perfect opportunity to work on it and check it out. And then he would take it on home. Well, don't buy things that often that you can't check. And especially don't buy $6,000 lays that you can't check. This lathe looked really good. This is a Monarch 10 EE. It uh, will turn 10 inches in diameter, 20 inch workpiece. It's highly, highly regarded as one of the most sought after high precision lays ever made. Uh, Monarch's been building these, I think, since the 50s and have gone through many, many different uh, changes. Uh, in the gearboxes, uh, and, and the big one has been in the motor control. Now, a lot of people, a lot of lathes just have a, a three-phase motor and a belt drive. These dudes, well, the one I have out in the other part of the shop, has a three-phase motor that turns a generator that generates 12-volt power, or, or, 12, or DC power, excuse me, and sends it to a honking big DC motor. You see, DC motors don't put pulses into the rotation of the shaft like AC does. DC is direct current, and it's very smooth. And they put a lot of electronics and tubes and all kinds of methods in these uh, machines to keep that very smooth so your work surface has the best possible finish. I know for 99.9% .9 of what guys like me do don't need it. You just go on to grind it. But that's their claim to fame. They sold a ton of these. They're really expensive. In fact, you can buy one today. They'll make you one. The last price I heard was $160,000. I think they sold six one year. But big corporations can afford it. I can't. So I buy the old ones and fix them up. Yeah, but back to our story of the spindle. This lathe was bought, sight unseen, brought over here. We were ooh and ah on it. Got a great paint job. The cabinet, I mean, who wouldn't love the electronics in a cabinet like that? Wow. Then we started noticing it had a few problems. So tonight, I'm going to show you what we found. I'm going to move you over and focus in on the uh, spindle and I'll show you what these idiots did to it. Now, this is the business end of any lathe. Most of the times, we worry about the ways and, and too much wear and having to regrind these and such. Well, this one's pretty good. The problem is here. Now... When we got the lathe in here, we started looking at it, and it had this collet, collet chuck on there. When we took it off, and I'm looking in there, and somebody had put pieces of aluminum air conditioning ductwork tape in here to build it up. After looking even closer, and this poor thing has been ground. 
and it's so short now that it won't fit the taper of any chuck. Started looking around some more and we found that parts of the saddle, the corresponding part to this, had had one of these edges just completely sheared off. So, we started looking at the spindle more closely and this is how we measured it to see what was going on. Now, first off, it's a very simple. You don't need a lot of tools. You should have all these already. Let's see if I can... I've got this lathe shoved up against the wall because it's not being actively worked on. adjusting it on the inside well let's go on the outside first I'm going to try to get it to where you guys can see this I'm reshooting this video because you couldn't see what I was doing Try to make this where you guys can see it better. Now you want this dial to be kind of straight out. So I don't know what I'm going to do to make it better for you. I think you can see that. Got a magnetic base holding this dial, and it's just touching that, and I've got it on zero. I'm going to go around the other side, and I'm going to hand turn the spindle, and we'll be watching that right there. You can see it's just just barely wavering maybe a tenth of an inch or ten thousandths of an inch at the most two ten thousandths which you check that you'd be really happy now I'm going to lean over and redo this turn it again. This is on the inside taper. There's one. Almost two, two thousandths of an inch right there. Just a shy under it. So this surface right here is two ten thousandths out. This surface in here, where you could put a, a, a tool, is almost two thousandths out. While we're here, another little thing that you check when you buy a lathe is to see if there's any end play in these bearings. Now I take a board, usually a two before, but I don't have one. And you put it underneath there and you lift up. And I know you can't see it, but I can barely lift this thing with a lot of pressure, maybe three ten thousandths. If I saw that I'd be happy on a regular lathe. Now let me move you to the other end. Okay, let me show you what I got going here. 
Sorry for the lighting, but I, I lowered the exposure so you can see the dial better. First time I shot this, you couldn't see anything, and you'd have to take my word for it. And Don says I lie a lot, so... What I've done is I've reattached the magnetic base over here. If you don't have one of these, one of their Noga arms, get one. Make my life much easier. What I'm trying to do is set it right on the bottom of that. There we go. I'll turn this dial around some. And we'll go to zero. Okay. Now, get you in here where you can see the dial better. See what we got here. All right there is one seven fifty. There's another. It's well over two thousandths of an inch run out on the inside of the spindle back here. And what I did earlier is I put a mark on this at the, the lowest point down here. And I moved around to the other side. And I put another mark. And lo and behold, here's the mark on this side, and the other side it's about three quarters of an inch over. So I know that this spindle is bent upwards. Okay, so what does that tell me? It tells me that that spindle has a bend in it right now going up. Now, if they had not a ground the spindle nose to make to try to make the chuck fit and run true, there's a possibility we could have straightened that by putting it on blocks and pressure. I mean, they straighten shafts all the time. Now, this is a precision spindle, and that may be a whole different ball game, but. Uh, you could give it a try. This one, unfortunately, we can't do anything with because they changed the geometry of the nose so much. And even if we were to regrind the face, make it down lower, get it to a perfect uh, geometry, you still have a bent U going around in those bearings. And believe me, these are really expensive, high-precision bearings. And for it to take a ticket like that where it bent that shaft, sorry, those I would never trust those bearings again. They're toast. So, first of all, you got to find a spindle or make one. I guess I could grind a spindle. But then you got to buy really expensive bearings. Now, we bought another machine at the same time, or we didn't, Andy did. This one did not have a taper attachment. And so he wanted a taper attachment. He wanted this to be a dream machine. So we found another Tinny E that had a taper attachment for $1,600. We went over to the other side of Houston, looked it over, and frankly, it was pretty sad shape. It was an older machine, but we bought it, or he bought it, and we trailered it over here, and it's sitting out there. It's the blue model. It has one of the earlier generation motor configurations, a motor generator. It doesn't have the electronics in the drawer. It doesn't have anything like this. Now, a lot of people will strip all of that out and put a three-phase motor with a... a Pace controller and control the speed that way. 
This blue monarch I have has a three phase motor that powers a generator that makes DC current that powers the big, big DC motor on the end and the gearbox. Well, when I got it, we looked at it and it wouldn't stay in gear. Somebody had put a wedge in it trying to keep it in gear. Well, I know a guy on PM that was making those gears at the time and I bought one for it and it's ready to go in there. It's just such a wonderful piece of artwork that I hate to put it in all the old machine and never see it again. And it was four hundred dollars. So these things can get really pricey quick. This one doesn't even run at full speed because something in the electronics is messed up. Uh that old blue one out there runs better than this one ever would run right now. So be careful what you buy. Don't just buy it because it was cheap or on an auction and it looked pretty in the later model. I mean, there's not as much wear on the other parts of the machine here. But boy, it's got an expensive electronic problem to solve. And spindles no way no for nada. Fire beware. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Know anybody else that has a spindle for one of these things? Give us a shout. Thanks for watching.